Welcome to Zoo Tours, the channel that brings the zoo right to you. And if you like zoos, then hit those like and subscribe buttons along with that bell icon to officially join the tour group. And before we begin, see if you can answer this episode's trivia question. Oh, how it's lovely weather to spend a zoo tour together with you because most of what you see was filmed in the summer. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Columbus Zoo, one of America's finest places to see wildlife. It has almost everything you'd want to see in a zoo. Lions, bears, koalas, its own aquarium, and hundreds of other species from several different regions in mostly high quality exhibits. But there is one aspect to zoos that I wish was executed a little more, which is theming. I always say, not a lot of zoos do it better than Memphis. But if we look at Columbus, the entrance to their nocturnal house is an Australian convenience store. The polar bear viewing is an abandoned mining town. Lions have taken over a crashed plane. And then there's Asia Quest. Opened in two phases in 2006, this very important attraction invites you to tackle an adventure across the world's largest continent. I feel the term immersive is overused, but the rock work, the cultural elements, and superb exhibitry makes you feel like you've left Columbus. It's all part of the illusion to enhance the Asia Quest's true message, which is all about conservation. Okay, so is every zoo exhibit these days. The difference is, Columbus makes it fun and engaging. They don't just say why an animal is endangered, they use subtle, entertaining, and positively odd methods that will make anyone stop and realize that these animals need our help. You and your tour group will cross paths with gems that are becoming fewer and fewer every year. Species that are not only hard to find in zoos, but some of Columbus's own residents that took me years to get a good look at. And with that, Let's begin. After what could be a multi-hour journey through the North American wilderness, the Arctic Circle, and plains of East Africa, you only have about a 10 minute break before your next adventure, which officially kicks off when you pass under this giant tiger-inspired stone entrance. Once you're on the other side, you're met with two lowered habitats intercepted by a covered bridge. The left side is a scenic landscape with a sequence of rice terraces and a tall, roaring waterfall. They are not always easy to find, but look for the tufted deer, otherwise known as the vampire bambi. As funny as it would be, they're not after blood. They're vegetarians. The nickname refers to the male's canine teeth that protrudes out of their mouth. They're used to fight other males and defense if needed. Sadly, they don't stop us from hunting them for their fur or logging and deforestation from agriculture. To the other side of the bridge is a similar yet less decorated enclosure. Last time I saw a rabbit, a giant Malaysian turtle, and do you know what's better than one deer with fangs? Two deer with fangs. The Siberian musk deer. Musk is a liquid that's secreted by males to mark their territory and attract a future mate. It also happens to be one of the most expensive animal products around. People use it to treat and try to prevent strokes, seizures, and nerve damage. It's also used as a flavoring in food and even perfume in cologne. Due to this high demand for the glands that produce this musk, the deer is expected to lose 30% of its current population over the next 20 years. Right over the connecting brick wall is something we'll save for later. So now it's time to head into the Quest for Enlightenment Interpretive Center. To line the entryway is a series of tiger sculptures on pedestals. Just one of the more subtle ways the Asia Quest gets the message of conservation across. The ones that are intact are the living subspecies, while the ones that are crumbled in ruins represent tigers that are now extinct. And if that doesn't catch your eye walking in, then maybe this dragon that officially welcomes you to Asia will do the trick. The center continues with a map showing where this attraction species are naturally found. A little further down, you'll find yourself in a Himalayan marketplace with scattered boxes containing a cobra and animal skulls to warn of illegal wildlife trade. One storefront encourages you to recycle. Another reminds us that extinction is forever. And my favorite, but most depressing, is a display case with a list of train departures and arrivals. 
Some have already left the station, while others are essentially waiting for their demise. We're now at the end of the hall, and I'm just giving you a preview of what you would see next, but I want you to forget that fluff of fur for now. The path then makes a sharp turn into what might be the most interesting hallway you'll ever go through. On our right is a long, tranquil giant that unless you're as blind as my assistant, they're literally impossible to miss. The reticulated python. As the world's longest snake, they need to have one of the world's heaviest diets. They attack, constrict, and swallow their prey with a 150 degree bite. Sometimes it's a pig, and other times it's a deer. When you come to the Columbus Zoo, be sure to stop by Jackie. Not many people know this, but she has some pretty big scales to fill. Before her and another python lived Fluffy. Reticulated pythons generally grow to be 9 to 16 feet. Fluffy was 24 feet and 300 pounds and named by Guinness Book of World Records as the world's longest snake in a zoo. Sadly, she passed away at 18 years young and was actually only here for a few years. But with her own legacy and the attention that she brought to the zoo, I am sure she is still missed by many zoo goers and staff alike. Now Jackie isn't quite there, but at 19 feet and 200 pounds, she is still by no means just an average snake. And to our left is another reptilian giant that you can't miss, the Asian Water Monitor. If you've ever wondered what the world's second biggest lizard was, well, you're looking at it. A male could tip the scale at 150 pounds and be five to eight feet long. One of the biggest lizards is also one of the most exploited. All that skin is often used for shoes, belts, and handbags for people who have no fashion sense. Despite this though, the Asian water monitor is widespread throughout Southeast Asia and is thought to be far from endangered. Next up is a long L-shaped display that I couldn't even fully describe in words if I tried. It looks like we're about to take a stroll through a courtyard garden, except this garden has a blue-faced honey eater, mainly found in Australia. There's also Burmese mountain tortoises and one of the zoo's newer additions, the Greater Malayan Chevrotain, also known as the mouse deer. But it's not a mouse and it's not a deer, but they are in their own family that are among the smallest kinds of hoofed mammals. They only get up to be about two and a half feet long, a foot tall and 12 pounds. And besides those pencil thin legs, their other really standout feature, the males also have fangs that stick out of their mouths. Now, if you were to look up, there's Malayan flying foxes right in front of your face. There are over 1400 kinds of bats. Nearly 200 of them are around this size and classified as mega bats. Some can be six inches, while others like these guys can be over a foot and spread their wings nearly five feet across. Bats are known for swarming in the hundreds of thousands. This flying fox though, isn't so lucky. Where they come from, farmers see them as pests for destroying their crops. Others though, kill them for their bush meat. There are just over 60 kinds of flying foxes and only 14 of them are considered safe from either endangerment or extinction for now. If you don't care for bats in your face, then maybe you won't mind monkeys. These are silvered langurs, the animals that we skipped earlier by the deer. I waited to show you them off because I rarely ever actually see them outside. If you visited a few years ago, you may notice their rooms look a little different. The walls got a paint job, the bars were replaced with faux trees, and the flooring was elevated. Silvered langurs are relatively peaceful within a group. Some think it's because they always have so much food, so there's never any competition over it. And when they eat, they like to face towards the tree trunk and away from everyone else. I did say they are relatively peaceful. True aggression happens over territory between different groups. Males chase away other males, but because these two are within the same troop, this is most likely play fighting. Everywhere you see these monkeys, there's always so many, and it's not just because they're social, but there is no strict breeding season. One female will usually give birth once every two years. Even so, they're still captured for the pet trade, hunted and eaten by humans, and are losing their habitat to palm plantations, leading to their conservation classification to be recently downgraded 
from near threatened to vulnerable to extinction. As soon as you exit onto the main path, you're drawn to go right back inside to the Vanishing Giants. First in line is a separate area off to the right. And for years, this was the indoor showing for their Black Rhino. You know, one of those rare Asian Black Rhinos of Africa. The outdoor space itself isn't new, but recently the two yards were combined. And that Black Rhino is now an Indian Rhino. This is Brian who showed up in April of 2021 from an ungulate conservation center. The zoo site says even though he is alone, which males are by nature, Brian here is on a breeding recommendation, but the females are not coming to him. Eventually, he'll be chasing them at the zoo's partner facility in the giant multi-acre pastures of the wild. Now, I can introduce you to their elephants a growing herd made up of seven Indian elephants. Phoebe and Connie, the mother and the aunt to most of the herd. Then there's Sunny and Rudy, younger females that came from the Ringley Brothers Elephant Center in 2016. And then there's the boys, Biko, who was born right here in 2009 to Phoebe. And next to him is Hank the Tank of Tampa Bay. He just only slightly stands out over the rest. At nine and a half feet tall and over 15,000 pounds, he is without a doubt up there in the ranks of the biggest Indian elephant in America. And he is the father to currently one of the smallest. I had to wait nearly an hour just to see him, but I eventually caught glimpses of baby Frankie. All 460 pounds of him at the time. He is Phoebe's sixth baby and the zoo's fifth and hopefully far from the last. One indicator of a healthy baby elephant is if they gain two to three pounds every day for several months. Frankie's average is five pounds a day. He was 260 when he was born in June. This was filmed in August and he was 770 at the beginning of December. Growing up, they face a mountain of challenges. The biggest one is a hungry tiger. One of the best things about elephants is they're always willing to help each other out. And if a predator is nearby the herd, the females will huddle around the baby and their mother, forming a several megaton impenetrable barrier between a determined cat and their prey. This debuted as, and still might be, North America's largest indoor pachyderm facility. And no, this of course is not the entire space. There is a smaller yard to the right of the rhino, which is where I only ever see Biko anymore. Which makes sense, he's about to hit maturity, and even though we all know, elephants are social. Young adult Asian elephant males prefer to be alone and could be for most of their lives. Behind the building is a private space that's about the exact same size as this. And to go with the renovated indoor area, they gave them an additional one and a half acres in 1998, bringing the outdoor space to a combined total of 1.8 acres. All that space, and the ironic thing is, the only time I ever see them actually out here is when it's freezing outside and they're usually inside when it's warm. Now, it may not be the prettiest, but it's still within the list of the top 10 largest Asian elephant facilities in North America. Remember that giant ball of fluff that we saw earlier? Well, that would be the Indian sloth bear. They appear cute, cuddly, and inviting. They eat termites and honey, but looks can be deceiving. The sloth bear is considered one of the most dangerous animals in Asia. Over the past two decades, this bear is responsible for mauling thousands and killing hundreds. But it's not like they're on the hunt to eat people. They just scare easily and like their personal space. That's not an easy thing to achieve when you're around people that have drastically reduced your natural habitat. Now this may be ridiculous to say, but you might be wondering why this habitat is so much more detailed than pretty much the entire rest of the zoo. This was intended for giant pandas. I got the idea from my source that because of this, some extra effort was put into this development. And as you saw, they can be seen from the Enlightenment Center. Their bedroom is actually disguised as an abandoned oil palm factory, another one of the zoo's subtle conservation themes. I know it's been a lot so far, but we're only a little more than halfway done. This is where you're advised to look up for the red pandas. I don't know about you, 
but I feel like they make headlines these days far more than their black and white and unrelated friends. Like every other zoo with red pandas, every few years there will be more and more babies, creating a temporary sensation from the crowd. But I'm referring to Cora. I don't know if this is her or not, I'm just going with it. One morning in July, she was discovered missing from this habitat. And despite a widespread search by zoo staff, the next day, Cora was spotted by two visitors somewhere just to the right of this shot. When the team arrived, she climbed a nearby tree. Staff tried to use treats, and they even brought her one-month-old cubs to bring her down. She climbed down a little, but the decision was finally made to tranquilize her. Cora fell into a net, and not only was she returned safe, sound, and healthy, she was reunited with her cubs. About 10 steps down the path is the aviary, a chance for some of Asia's most colorful birds to show off their designs. Of the zoo's five walkthrough ave displays, I'd have to say that this is my favorite. The experience is a short but sweet walk through a Chinese garden. Look out for smews, Nicobar pigeons, western cattle egrets, azure winged magpie, and the striking Reeves pheasant with the world's longest natural tail feather of any wild bird. And this display is one of my favorites because you don't just find birds. There are more brown tortoises and Reeves munt jacks, Asia Quest's fourth and final hoofed animal with tusk-like canines. They're very, very shy. Yet we know so much about them, especially their past. The first muntjacks appeared 20 million years ago, making them the oldest known species of deer. And it doesn't look like they're going anywhere. Reeves muntjacks may be hunted for their meat and soft skins for the fur market. Thanks to year-round breeding, they are also far from endangered. In case the aviary is closed, as it is during the colder months, or if you're afraid any of these creatures are out to get you, you can bypass the aviary and see everything from the outside. From China, the path is taking us west for an encounter with the Markor. Markor, from Persian origin meaning the snake killer. It's possible this title came from their snake-shaped horns, but I like the other theory better. According to legend, this goat kills serpents with their horns and finishes the job by eating them. Afterwards, it would spit a material that could extract venom from a snake bite. Markor can kill one with their powerful hooves, but there's no evidence they enjoy snake for dinner. So this tail is as tall as their horns. Both male and female have them, but the boys carry those five foot long corkscrews on their head. They use them for digging up food, taking the bark off trees, and butting heads with other males to determine who will win the female's heart. Markor prefer the high wooded mountains of Western Asia, native to elevations as high as 11,000 feet, and you can say they're pretty good at climbing. In fact, within the first 20 minutes of being on exhibit, one managed to get over these rocks and landed somewhere no Markor wants to end up. They go to the high slopes to avoid wolves, leopards, and us. They are highly valued for their horns. If you want to hunt one, you have to pay wildlife managers a hefty price. The population is at an estimated 5,800, but with these new restrictions, those numbers are increasing. And in 2015, the Markor was removed from the endangered species list and is now only considered near threatened. Coming from the same region, it only took me 11 years, but I finally got proper movement from their palace cat. Looks like the kind that won't stop knocking the ornaments off the tree. They're the same size as one, but I'll bet your cat isn't willing to trek the mountains of Central Asia. In fact, they live in higher elevations than the Markor, and it's a good thing they have the densest fur of any cat to keep them warm. Unfortunately, it doesn't protect them from all of the other threats they face. Their habitat is destroyed to make way for livestock. Their prey, such as pikas and marmots, are regularly poisoned to prevent the spread of disease. So there goes the cat's food and a good part of their shelter. Since these felids can't dig burrows themselves, they rely on the marmots to do it for them. Not to mention, they're also hunted for their fur. Despite everything I just said, as of 2020, the IUCN upgraded the palace cat from near threatened to extinction to least concerned due to their large, widespread population. 
By the way, that escaped Markor ended up in the realm of the Amor Tiger. And I don't blame the spiral horned creature. I too am always eager to get to this part of the quest to see one of America's top suitable tiger displays. Most might look at tigers as a tropical creature. That's mostly true for the five other subspecies. But the sixth prefers snowy and boreal forests of Russia and China. These forests have the lowest human density of any other tiger habitat, yet they are one of the few animals on this journey that are actually considered endangered. In what seems like a mountain of bad news on this video, I at least have a few positive facts. The zoo does have a thriving tiger breeding program. They've donated hundreds of thousands of dollars that went into saving tigers in the wild. And lastly, the population is on the rise, or at the very least officially labeled as stable. Thanks to government protection, numbers have increased by 15% over the last decade. You can't forget the habitats that were left over before Asia Quest took over. A long boardwalk leads you to an elevated shelter tucked in between two identical narrow spaces. For years, the right one showcased lions, last temporarily keeping their juvenile males that were born in the heart of Africa. Today, they are now both home to another Amor tiger. I imagine some might not find it worth walking up a boardwalk just to see the same species they just saw. But nearly every time I've made this walk, I got to see and hear their male put on a show. And that is the end of not only one of the Columbus Zoo's prized exhibits, but one of the country's must experience zoo attractions. So many zoos try to push their visitors to get inspired and help wildlife by exposing the dire situations these animals face every day. If you want to get inspired to make a difference, I implore you to visit the Asia Quest. Let's say that you don't want to wait. You can donate to the many organizations provided in the description that help save the species that we just saw that are out in the wild. Also, check out these other Asia-themed exhibits I'm sure you'll enjoy, and as always, thank you for watching.